Welcome to the Tapestry of Life. I am Dr. Pascal Scholes, Professor of Behavioral Health and Human Services at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's topic is methadone and recovery. For our viewers, methadone is a synthetic opioid. It is mainly used in the treatment of opioid dependency. The, the medication is cross-tolerant with other opioids, including heroin and morphine, and offers very similar effects with a long duration of effect. It was developed in Germany in 1937. Methadone is also used in the management of severe chronic pain. Abuse of methadone results in about 5,000 overdose deaths per year in the United States. Over the past few years, the name methadone maintenance treatment has been changing to medication-assisted recovery. The primary objective of this new National Alliance movement is to advocate for individuals in treatment and desensitizing and empowering medication-assisted treatment patients. To discuss the topics today, I want to welcome back my co-host, Kerry Arnold, a faculty <coughs> member of Community College of Philadelphia Behavioral Health Program, and my two very special guests, Yvette Moore and Andrew Riccardi. Both of those students, one is a graduate of Community College of Philadelphia, and the other student, uh, Andrew, is actually taking courses right now. So welcome back Thank to the community, yes. as they say. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you know, it, 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 I could start in a, in a variety of places, but, uh, you know, at, at one time in my life I did run a methadone program. It was in the late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, and there was a real stigma towards it. So hearing some of your stories and maybe getting a sense of what it's like today would be very, very helpful. Now, I do hear some of it because I, in another venue, I'm on the Mayor's Drug and Alcohol Commission, so I do get feedback about things like uh, communities that don't want methadone in their neighborhood yet. Yes. So th that old stigma still exists. But we'd love to hear your story and then talk about maybe a couple other topics. Go ahead, you can go first. Oh, yeah, okay. your daddy's pushing you uh, first. <laughs> okay. um, I think um, as far as uh, method on maintenance, there is a big stigma. Um, from my experience, um, it's, 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 uh, you can recover, it helps you to recover, um, just like any other medication that you would take for anything else, mm -hmm. diabetes, uh, cancer, it all has this particular medication that you would take. And there's also things that you have to do along with that. It's, nothing mm -hmm. is, a, is a magic pill. You know, it's, it's not like you, you, you get on the program and you get medicated and you're cured. It, it's, it's, you have to work. Um, it is another path to recovery it's that historically many people uh, did have some difficulty with. But I think in the last five or seven years, there's been a significant change in attitude, so to speak, and change in movement. Yeah. Would you think? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think um, prior to going on the method of maintenance, I, I, I attended 12-step meetings, mm -hmm. and um, there's a huge stigma in 12-step meetings about methadone and people saying all you're doing is substituting methadone for heroin and uh, you're not clean or sober if you're taking it. And, um, you know, I, I've read NA and AA literature and NA literature very specifically states any mood or mind altering substance. So my first rebuttal to them was, well, you're outside smoking cigarettes and you're, uh, you know, drinking 10 cups of coffee and nicotine and caffeine are the two of the most addictive substances known to man. Mm -hmm. And well, they're not mood or mind altering. I said, well, if you well, they're smoke, also taking antidepressants. Yeah, I said you if know, you smoke, mood disorders. Go so. a day yes. without smoking and see what kind of mood you're in, and then <laughs> tell me it's not mood altering. Yeah. So, um, I can't compare myself to other people. I compare myself to myself. Three years prior to walking into a methadone clinic, I was homeless. Uh, I couldn't hold a job. I wasn't a father to my daughter. I didn't speak to anyone in my family, mm -hmm. 
and my life has drastically changed in three years being on in maintenance. In a positive way. In a positive mm -hmm. way. Like a vet said, it is not my, it doesn't encompass my recovery. It is one tool I use in an arsenal for my recovery. Um, it, it, it helps with the cravings, the, uh, you know, the, the, the physical cravings of the drug. And I was able to work on other things, not having to worry about the cravings. Um, I'm a huge proponent of cognitive restructuring, changing the way I think. Um, my whole thought, recovery to me is very simple, it's change. I mean, it, it, it's that simple, change. And, and I had to change a lot of things. Um, what, uh, do you mind sharing a little bit of your history? I mean, uh, can you tell us a little about where did you start using drugs? And, and we don't talk much mm -hmm. about heroin. Once in a while, mm -hmm. it comes through in some of the tapestry shows. Mm -hmm. And rarely do I even have an opportunity to talk with people on this show about the, the use of methadone in the, the way in which it's been changing as a medication as opposed to? For me, it was um, very simple. I, I come from a very large family. Um, in Philadelphia? I, I, I'm originally from Philadelphia, South Philadelphia. My mother passed away when I was two. Um, my father was dealing with his own issues, so my aunt raised us. We moved to South Jersey. I had two brothers and a sister. She had four kids of her own, um, so my aunt raised eight of us, and actually another cousin of mine was also in the house. So there was nine kids very close in age in the house. My aunt, my grandmother, uh, pretty much raised us. I also had another aunt in my life who was, didn't live there per se, but was always there. Um, no male influence in my life, but um, uh, there was never alcohol in our house. My, no one ever did drugs in our house, um, you know what I mean? But for me personally, I, I went to college, Towson University. I played football, um, never really drank it and get in the drug scene in high school. I was, I, I had a, a Pretty much surgery. a model student. <laughs> yes, I mean, in, in all, yes, you would say. Um, and then I, I was playing football in college. I had surgery on my knee. Uh, I was prescribed painkillers. And uh, that was the start of my addiction. I came home from college. I didn't have a degree. I wasn't working. I was depressed. And um, I... I know there's arguments about the whole genetic thing um, with, with drugs, whether you're predisposed to a genetic disorder. I, I don't know what the facts are on that. I know addiction runs on my father's side of the family. Mm -hmm. But when I took those pills and um, between the depression not working and the feeling of those pills, it just gave me something that I it was kind of wow and I wanted more of that. What and was that feeling for the audience? It I was mean. it was a euphoric feeling. I mean, um it, it was that warm sensation coming over your body. Everything's going to be okay. Almost I can almost can compare it to like what we're talking about in class with the flow like being in the moment. All that mattered in my life at that time was that moment, that mm -hmm. feeling. Um and I, and I liked it, and it, it was the natural progression of addiction. It went from not working um, to Percocets, painkillers, to eventually Oxycontin, to eventually shooting heroin. And it was a progression over 10 years. It over didn't happen years. overnight. So you didn't uh, do what uh, some people refer to as the gatekeeper story, where you start with marijuana and then you move into other things. Yeah, possibly. No, no, you, that's went, not, you went right to the top yes, line. That's, right, not my, that's not my story. <laughs> Um, and like recovery, there's a lot of avenues to recovery. There's a lot of avenues to addiction, but it all, for me, it all ends up to the same place, the dereliction, um, all the external things and the things you hear about in NA, the, uh, jails, institutions, and death, it, that was the easy part. The hard part for me was the things in between, the homelessness, um, not knowing where you're going to eat or sleep or get money to, for the next bag, um. I knew what I was doing was wrong, and I knew uh, I, w I was hurting people in my life, but at the time, I didn't have the ability to care. I was so caught up in an addiction, and that's where, um, you know, the literature in NA talks about the selfishness of our disease. I, I, just, I just didn't have the ability to care about what I was doing to other people. Um, so that's really how it was for me. That's how my well, it does take, started. You know, if you, if you look at Kohlberg's work on moral judgment, you know, the whole morality and how you evolve that you can see where you lose your morality and addiction because mm. it's just you and the drug. An you animalistic know. level. Yeah, you do mm. get pretty basic with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, you know, now hearing from, a, you know, a, a male perspective mm -hmm. and here's Yvette sitting next to you and it, mm -hmm. it, what, what is always interesting to me is the way that uh, 
we have so many faces mm -hmm. that we put on recovery and yet there are so many similarities in our story. So I'm curious, Yvette, what was your story? What well, was your root? Believe it or not, my story is very similar mm -hmm. to Andrew. I grew up in a household. Uh, it wasn't a huge family. It was, it was three of us as far as kids. Um, and my parents' focus was education. Education, education, education. My mother didn't drink. Uh, she didn't smoke. Drugs wasn't, um, uh, it was a topic, but it wasn't anything that was stressed because there was no one in the household be, like we didn't have anything to compare mm. um, not using to someone that's using. I mean, the biggest commercial back then was, you know, the egg in the frying pan right. thing. Right. You know, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that was the biggest. The Ronald egg. Reagan era. Right. Yeah, I and actually that have that poster the, in my office. The, and, and, and that and was the this commercial. This is your one with, with bacon, it says, I think, at one point, too. Yeah. Yeah. This is your joint. And, uh, you know, um, education was the thing. Uh, uh, when you finish your, your 12 years of school, you know, you had to make a choice. Mm -hmm. um, parents preferred you to go to college, and, you know, if not, you had to work. You had, you, it, it, was, it was something, but drugs wasn't, wasn't a factor, and I, myself, didn't get into um, heroin until I was 26. Mm -hmm. And that was the time, you know, I was the youngest of three. I was the last one to leave the home. How were you introduced to heroin? A uh, friend. Friend? A friend. Uh, it's pressure. always friends. Wanting to be, wanting to be a part of, you know, mm -hmm. I used to hang out with, with my yeah. girlfriends and, um, you know, I would come down and they always used to call me goody two shoes mm -hmm. uh, because I went to Catholic school my whole life. So I would come down and hang out and they would always disappear and go to the bathroom. And I was like, what are you guys doing? You know, but to make a long story short, um, that's what they was doing. They was going to the bathroom and they was snorting heroin and I didn't know anything about heroin. I had, mm -hmm. no, and I, all I wanted to be was a part of. Right. I want to do what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know um, the effects, the the long term use. I, I didn't know anything about it until it happened. Yeah. You know, I, I went through the whole steps, and I didn't go, um, you know, and seek professional help in the beginning. Like when I realized that I was addicted, I thought I had the flu. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriends would call me. Which is saying, withdrawal. Yes. <laughs> which I did not know yeah, at exactly. the time. So uh, my girlfriends would call me on the phone and say, well, come on, let's go. And I was like, no, I don't feel good. You know, I think I got the flu. I need to go to the doctors. And they, was, they were saying, well, you, what, you're not feeling good? I was like, oh, I'm so achy. And, you know, my nose is running. And, you know, I don't know. I must have, like, went outside after a shower or something this week because I've just, you know, I feel like I feel sick. So you never how? made the connection between I didn't make the connection between not having the drug and then going into withdrawal. Did not have didn't know the connection. Mm. Uh, it wasn't told to me. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the long term use of this drug by my friends. Like I said, I just wanted to be a part of. You know. You know. You know. It's you know what always startles me about uh, uh, the use of drugs is that, including myself in the story, we used all these drugs and know nothing about them. And we think yeah. that the drug dealer is going to give us some truth when they're just salesmen. Exactly. I mean, they're just yeah. selling a product. Mm -hmm. They could be selling a car, right. you know, or anything, but they sell drugs. And, and you say, how is the drug? And they say, oh, it's great, man. Make you feel good, you know. They don't tell you, oh, by the way, if you take too much of it, you want to have a withdrawal, and withdrawal looks like this because right. then they won't sell as much. Right. Is, is that... Yeah, well, it, it was, well, and, well, yeah, when it comes to the point of, of dealing with the drug dealers, but in the beginning, I didn't, I didn't know who to buy the stuff right. from her. You know, I would get it from my friends and things like that, but like you said, they don't tell you. Yeah, but your friends uh, didn't even say, oh, oh look, no. you're that, you got to watch. You know what they said? They said, uh, oh, you don't want any of this, and, you know, you've never done this before, and I was like, well, you guys are doing it, like. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll tell uh, you they don't want you to do it, but yeah. they're doing it right in front they're of you. They're doing it. They would yeah. disappear in the bathroom, uh, yeah. you know. And I was like, you know, what are you guys doing? And, and curiosity yeah. and me wanting to be a part of. Um, yeah, bathrooms are like shopping malls for drugs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the trust <laughs> I put in a drug dealer was <laughs> amazing. Unbelievable. It's, yeah. And you're exactly right. The whole trust, I trusted him. One of the crazy things, and, and I've done this, and I know a lot of people in the population do this, when I would hear of someone overdosing in a particular oh, site, I, I ran to That's that exactly, corner, yeah. mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. because of the, the, my, my attitude was, well, it won't, and it'll never happen to me. It must be good because they're overdosing, but I know how much to take. Well, you know what the story is, that if someone overdoses, you would have grabbed that dope because it probably wasn't cut properly. 
So you then can cut it and stretch it out yeah, more. Yeah. And I mean, so you don't turn the person in who overdoses. Mm -hmm. You take his drugs and then maybe call. Maybe call. You always, you know, yeah, you always look through their you pockets. Look through that. whatever you can take. I mean, but people, that's, it's hard for people to understand that, that you're going there not to save someone. No, you're I was going, going there to, to get high. But that's classic the heroin addiction. The, that's yeah. the insanity of the addiction. Yeah, it is. Insanity. Insanity. Yeah. Addiction. It's, yes. And I'm curious, too, as we're, as we're talking about the, the, what happens, the distortions in thinking and the progression, and there's a lot that's written about the faster progression for women than men. And Andrew, you talked about your entryway in through painkillers and, and a variety of things. I'm curious, Yvette, you started, you, you tried this out to belong at the age of 26. When you started noticing those withdrawal symptoms, how old were you? How long did well, the progression I, take? When I, oh, as far as me being, oh, geez. Uh, it didn't take long. Mm -hmm. It didn't take long. I mean, uh, like I said, when I first tried it, I was I was 26. Uh, it might have been um, maybe a, f a few months because in the beginning uh -huh. I was just doing it on the weekends, sure. you mm -hmm. know, um, and then um, not. I was I was so amazed at when my friend said, "You don't need to see the doctor. Yeah. You don't know. You don't need to go to the doctor." And my whole life, when I feel these symptoms, that's what it was. It was a cold. It was mm -hmm. the flu. My parents, you know, they took me to the doctor, and that's, you know, yeah. and uh, she said, that's not what you need. Come down. Mm -hmm. Come down my house. And I was like, well, no, I don't feel like it. And I get down her house. I snorted a bag of heroin. And then and, you felt better. And, and Immediately. Lo and behold, yeah. mm -hmm. all those symptoms was gone. So. And I, I was amazed. I said, mm. and she says, uh, now you're addicted. You can't go without unless you're gonna feel what you felt when you woke up today. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I said, are you kidding me? Did any of that scare you? Of course it did. Yeah. Of course it mm -hmm. did. Uh, when, you, when you felt bad, you, you took, uh, you know, a, a Tylenol for a headache or something. Uh, you know, when you was feeling sick, you, you get in the bed, you drink orange juice, you have some soup. I was like, you mean to tell me I have to do this so I don't feel like I felt this morning? Right. And yeah, I was in awe of that. Mm. I was, and you look up, and in the beginning, once you get over the initial shock, and and you hanging out and you're partying and things like that, you look up, and it's like, wow, it 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 really progressed really quick, mm -hmm. you know. Um, where not did, working as much. I was going to just ask you, where out. did this take you to? Yeah, I was I, w I was a person that never called out on a job. Mm -hmm. I always had a bunch of sick time, personal time. All that changed. Mm -hmm. You know, I would go out for lunch. Supposed to have, you know, maybe a 40, 40 minute lunch. I'll be gone for an hour and a half because I didn't get what I needed to get before I got to work. So I'm mm -hmm. feeling like crap at work. So I have to go out for lunch and, you know, I'm taking long extended lunches. You know, if the dealer wasn't there on my lunch break, then I wasn't going back to work yet. I, mm -hmm. I, I feel like crap. Sure. So yeah. that turned into, oh, calling the job, making up excuses of why I can't come back to work. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it, it progressed uh, really quickly. And I hate, I hate to say, um, just to jump ahead a little bit, um, when I uh, realized that I could get help, because my fear was I didn't know if I could get help um, to, uh, you know, sustain from, from um, the drugs. So when I realized that I could and, you know, things was looking better, you know, I had a ten and a half year stretch. With, with no drug, and I'm getting to this because of the relapse, mm -hmm. okay? So, so after how did you clean up the first time? <laughs> you don't have, you know, yeah, we're, 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 we're both, both going to the same place. Yeah. <laughs> what happened, uh, how come you stopped for 10 and a yeah. half years, what happened? Well, I got, well, my life would, became uh, just the opposite of became unmanageable. what was instilled in me yeah. as far as, you know, um, how I was raised, you know? the morals and, and um, the education and, and, and things that, you know, just being a, a productive member, just, just living life normally. Like, you know, my girlfriends I went to school with, just, just regular life, nothing fantastic, just doing the right thing. If you're supposed to get up in the morning and go to work, you go to work, mm -hmm. you know? If you're getting up and you have classes, you go to class. Just, just normal life things to prepare you for when you get to that retirement age. And, you know, it, it wasn't anything complicated, but all that was pushed by the wayside. Yeah. You know, once you become addicted um, to any substance, 
and for me it was did, her. Did you get professional help, or, to, or did you? Oh have yes, I did. Because again, me going into her on blind side, it, it was the first time you get in treatment. So I finally went to my family because they got to a point to say, you know, something is going on. You don't even look the same. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, after the lying so much, and oh, I just don't feel good today, and. You know, your family knows when something is wrong and you're just not that same person. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I finally broke down and I asked my sister. I said, you just, you know, I'm addicted to heroin and I don't know how to come off. I don't, I don't know if I can just stop using it mm -hmm. and be strong enough to get through that, that physical sure. withdrawal. I can't do that because it's too painful for me, you know. Um, so... Uh, just to backtrack a little, I think that's what kept me using longer. That's right. Because yeah. true. There, true. The I, didn't, I didn't think mm -hmm. there was something that could help me get off of the heroin. Um, but when I did realize that it was something and I could get help, then I got help, uh, professional help, and I took all the suggestions. You know, you need to go to detox first. I went to detox. When I was in detox, I was like, well, what do I need to do? Well, we suggest you go to a 30-day program. I went to a 30-day program. Okay, I'm at the end of that. What do I do next? Well, now you need to go to, um, you know, um, uh, a six-month um, inpatient living environment with mm -hmm. other recovering um, right. addicts like yourself. I did that. Um, this was probably in, what, it must have been in the 80s or, or something. Well, it was late 90s. Oh, was it? Because, because of, I'm from Baltimore, oh, so okay. I came here in Philadelphia. Oh, you're one of the Baltimore people that yeah, came up. Yeah, I came <laughs> here in 1999. Well, the reason I say that is because in, in the 90s. 80s and 90s, the only alternative for heroin recovery or opioid recovery was go totally drug-free. Mm -hmm. And that's the model you're following. You know, we used to send them all to 30 days and then 90 days of AA and then the mm -hmm. NA. And, and that, there was, you know, and methadone at the time, which was around, was restricted almost to a more chronic, older population right. of people. And there was a stigma within the drug field that uh, don't go into methadone program. Right. If you, mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, that, and so there was a tendency for people in drug free to say, go drug free. Now mm -hmm. that has changed, and we'll talk a little yeah. mm -hmm. about that as time goes on, but that was ten and a half years ago, or whenever. Yeah, there's definitely a stigma with that. Um, like like a, a vet kind of, a, a little bit different. I'd, I'd, gone to, um, I'd gone down to Florida for treatment. Um, I never had a problem really um, getting clean and sober. It was always staying, staying yeah. clean and sober. Mm -hmm. I'm a very... Um, but that's pretty typical. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> it over is. is the problem. You know, right. six months, nine months, a year, that wasn't the problem. Yeah. It was the longevity. Um, <laughs> I'm a very motivated type person. So if I get involved in something, I'm going to get involved wholeheartedly. So I, I was told very early in recovery, go at your recovery the same way you went at your addiction. And that, mm -hmm. and that worked for me because when I was an active, like, like a vet said, heroin consumed my life. When yeah. I was a heroin addict, I don't believe... I don't like the word trigger only because of the fact that I didn't have triggers. The only trigger I had was waking up. As long as I woke up, I was going to get high that day. Well, that By, was your trigger that, being alive. That was my trigger yeah. being alive, exactly. Yeah. And that's what I tell people, uh, any means necessary. No matter what, I was going to do something. To, and that I'd done things that I'm not proud of because of the, the disease of addiction. Yeah. Yes. In recovery, it's the same way. Um, no matter what I need to do, just for today, I'm going to work on my recovery. So I don't go back to that place that I was at. Um, because for me, it, it, it's the same way the addiction was a process, the recovery is a process too. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's interesting, Andrew, to hear you just describe it in this way. One of the things that, that, that just jumped out at me was the, when you talked about there was no trigger just getting up. Really, the truth of the matter was that getting up to be in life was too much. Mm -hmm and that you mm -hmm. went right to the drug. And what I'm hearing mm -hmm. you say is, you wake up now in recovery is when you actually want to be in life. Without a doubt. Uh -huh. I mean, in my active addiction, my life revolved around a three block radius in sure. South Philly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I had a real good idea what my day was going to be about. I knew where I was going to end up if I didn't get arrested. Um, 
if three years ago when I walked into this process, if you told me this would be my life in three years in recovery on methadone, mm -hmm. there's no way. I would have mm -hmm. never thought that. Um, the potential, and not for me, any person in recovery is unlimited. I mean, the things that, just the population alone, if you were to sit down and talk with someone who has life experience of addiction and they could tell you some of the things they were able to come up with to, uh, yeah, it's a negative aspect, but th things they were able to come up with to get money or do things, very, very intelligent, mm -hmm. intelligent, smart mm -hmm. individuals. Well, I've often said that and, and some of the most creative people creative. are people in their addiction. Yeah. If they could just convert that, to positivity. they could be very effective counselors mm -hmm. and yes. therapists and Without life partners and all of the things because many of the struggles are the struggles of life, which mm -hmm. you happen to be using that struggle to make sure that at the end of the day, you're not in withdrawal. Yeah. But you could be using it as a resilient person in the material mm -hmm. that you're looking at in the class, for example, yeah. to make your life more mm -hmm. positive. And to imp impact other people. I mm -hmm. mean, um, the power of hope, I mean, it, it, it's, it's unequal. The, the, the reality of it was I was in early, uh, excuse me, early recovery. There were people in my life that would talk to me and, and tell me their story and what they went through. And, and my theme early in recovery was, why not me? Why right. not me? If, yeah. if this person can do it, why can't I? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the altruistic movement in AA, one person helping another, um, the whole transformation in the city with people in recovery working. I ask people all the time, uh, uh, as I work at a facility now, and I, and I do groups, and, and they, a lot of the common thing is they'll raise their hand, they'll say, I'm so-and-so and I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. well, why do you say that? Where does that even come from? Um, because I, the whole uh, uh, empowerment, empowering individuals. Mm -hmm. why, why, well, I, that's what they say in AA. Well, do you know the history of it? Do you know that it has a negative connotation? Do you feel it has a negative connotation? Why, like, try to get them to think about things. I don't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son. You're many I'm things. so many yeah, other things right. than, a, than an addict. And right. when I address myself, I'm a person in recovery today. Mm -hmm. I go to AA meetings still, I do NA meetings, and I raise my hand, I'm Andrew, and, I, and this is what I'm gonna say. And, mm -hmm. and I don't need to address myself in that. I, and that's just my opinion, it's a personal thing, but- um, Well, it's your path, Yeah, and it's, it's a good path. Yeah. I mean- and, I just believe in empowerment, empowering people that um, this, this recovery thing is available and it's, it's feasible for anybody it's going to take some work and some effort, but the rewards pff, are, are astounding. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It it's, really it's is. It's beautiful to hear you describe this. You know, I know we were all talking earlier, and this is so in the spirit of the city's movement of recovery and transformation mm -hmm. about person-first language. It's also in the spirit of the whole of the anonymous people and about putting a face to recovery, it's it's what the whole tapestry of life show is is about. When we have people here who are are in recovery, that you know, just as much as there's the stigma that comes with even saying the word methadone, there's the stigma with saying the word addict. There's a stigma that about saying the word alcoholic, and you know, there are still people that go to twelve step meetings, and and so part of the part of the uh, uh, the defense for that is that some people, especially early on, need to hear themselves say that out loud so they don't forget that that's actually what keeps it green for me and mm. that I, I don't want to forget that. But the other piece of it is just what you said. You are so many different roles and, and uh, uh, you know, you, you, you have so many different functions in your life. This happens mm. to be one. I loved even earlier when you said you have an arsenal of yeah. things mm -hmm. that are part of your mm -hmm. recovery. Yeah, and, that, and that's the reality of it. And, and you're right, the tra I'm a huge fan of the whole transformation that the mm -hmm. city's involved in. And, and just um, the, whole, uh, the whole stigma of the word, I, I just, uh, of, of methadone, of, of mm -hmm. addict, I just think for me, um, I, I try to keep everything positive. I know my past, I know what I, I'm no longer ashamed to tell people that uh, I'm, I'm a person in recovery. Mm -hmm. I very openly speak about my, my heroin addiction, things that I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. The greatest compliment for me that I get from people is, we don't know you when you were actively using and the things you tell us, we can never picture you doing 
because I don't conduct myself in the yeah. same, I, I don't act like a drug addict. I don't talk like a, a person in active addiction. I respect yeah. myself today. Mm -hmm. So um, that that is one of the biggest compliments I can give now with great, you know, it, it takes, uh, I have to conduct myself like a vet said, a, a, produ a productive member of society. To me, recovery is so much more than active mm -hmm. drug use. Uh, yes. All the other behaviors that came with it, the prostitution, the women uh, that I pick up, bootleg movies. I mean, th that's how serious I get with it because if it's okay mm. to indulge in those behaviors today, tomorrow it's okay to do something else, and then eventually it's okay to do one bag of heroin. Yeah. Mm. So right. it's so much more than just drug drug addiction, like recovery for me. I'm recovering right. from, from self. I mean. Well, the whole city movement, yeah. as was mentioned earlier, the whole movement from Dr. Evans' office out of the Department of Behavioral Health, uh, it's one of the first times where a whole city engaged themselves uh, in, in the concept of recovery and transformation. Uh, you, know, you know, like I'm alive and doing well in mm -hmm. Philadelphia, as they say sometimes. Yeah. So, so you have an agency that actually is very supportive of the general movement in the community, although I will say, hearing some of the community, some of the community is really a little hesitant about the whole concept of transformation, etc. I'm not. I think it's mm -hmm. a, a wonderful movement, and I think it's a, a path to recovery for many, many different people, and there are many avenues to one's recovery. One of them is through the use of methadone. One of them is through drug-free. One of them is through... Through and religious through twelve spaces. step, there there's many avenues. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know. I'm curious because now that we're we're on this thread, is Yvette, you alluded earlier to the fact that you had ten and a half years in recovery and then you had a relapse. Right. Yes. Curious. This is always something that 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 uh, becomes something where where people have judgments about this and, and, and it can come with, with, with shame and, and other things. I'm, I'm always curious about what people learned from that experience and, and really curious about how you had the 10 and a half years, what changed mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. and what brought you back? Mm -hmm. um, when I had those 10 and a half years, um, I stepped away from the most important thing, which was my support. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's uh, like this, the symbol has in NA. It's like the bigger your groundwork, you have all these things. You have support, you have your 12 step, mm -hmm. you have your sponsor, you have all these things. And the higher your, your temple goes. Yeah. So uh, I didn't have too much in my groundwork. Like when I was working, I worked in the field. Uh, I went to work every day just as if it was a meeting. Mm -hmm. So I started stepping away from my meetings. Gotcha. I was dealing with clients that was uh, drug and alcohol and mental health. So uh, me going to work every day, I was like, oh, this is just like a meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, um, I was so engrossed in my work. Um, and it was things that was important that I needed to continuously work on that I failed to do. So. Uh, when that big change happened in my life, like I got laid off from uh, an employer after mm -hmm. 10 years, um, I should have been able to handle that differently than the way I did. But being as though my groundwork was shaky yep. and I didn't have a solid ground, when I got uh, laid off, I went into this depression mm -hmm. um, for months and months. Um, that was uh, May of 2010, and by February of 2011, I was using. Mm -hmm. So what happened? What was the actual uh, entryway right back in there? Did you return back to the environment where you knew that you could get that? You were in yeah, because a lot that of pain? Ne that never changes. Mm -hmm. That environment, that whole drug, that never changes. You know, we, we may change, yeah. but you know, an addict knows where to go, mm -hmm. um, and you just go right mm -hmm. back to, to the same old, same old. Like People, I said, places, and things. It never changes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Picking so the, tri up was the, the last trigger was, I guess, 
being laid off and that created a certain amount of well, stress it, and depression. I guess that might have been the trigger, the, the trigger, one of the triggers. Uh, but even before me getting laid off, there was some things that I wasn't doing oh, okay. uh, as far as to maintain okay. uh, my sobriety. You weren't being that, very resilient. That piece is really mm -hmm. important. You know, we just had a discussion last night, Yvette, in one of our classes where the students are learning about motivational interviewing and we're working on the stages of change. One of the things we talked about that is sort of the perfect storm for a relapse is when somebody decides that they don't need to continue doing what was working and in exactly. part of their maintenance plan. You described it so beautifully. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and then when you have a, a life-changing event or, mm -hmm. or something that happens in your life, so you, you, can't, you can't handle that because you... Uh, I should have been able to process process that more than um, what happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, because I stepped away from my support and all those things yes. that helped me along the way during those ten years, um, by the time I got laid off, it was like I didn't I didn't have too much of anything mm -hmm. on my ground, you know. So uh, I got into this big depression. Oh, the heck with it, you know. You get that woe is me. How uh -huh. dare they? You know, you go through these these steps, you know, mm -hmm. and you get all angry. The, all, and, this, all the self pity and exactly. self centeredness that we talk uh, about. All and the years I put in with this company, how how could they lay me off? And mm -hmm. you know, um, and uh, uh, when the relapse happened, let me tell you, it, it wasn't like it happened ten years later. Uh -huh. It was like. Yesterday, exactly. Right back, exactly. Right back. Right back. If not yesterday, two days before yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, even, it was even physiologically it that occurs because people who were drinking like a fifth of liquor, say a day, and have been in recovery for like ten or twelve years, when they relapse, they can go right back to a fifth, mm -hmm. real fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting that if you did that and you were not a person in recovery, you would probably probably die, die from yeah. that. You probably right. die. Mm -hmm. But your right. your memory and your pathways are so well integrated, it's always there. That's why recovery is mm -hmm. always there. Mm -hmm. yeah. The mm -hmm. the issue of addiction or whatever word you want to use for it is always there. Yeah. But here's another point I want to make or an interesting thought. Um, I've often thought, uh, and, and we talk a little bit about this in the faith course around resilience and transformation, mm -hmm. but I often thought that an individual's pathology, and I use that from a medical perspective, not from the social perspective. Mm -hmm. An individual's pathology is the community's pathology. And without the right community supporting mm -hmm. individuals, mm -hmm. and without individuals supporting community, everyone who is in recovery is prone to relapse. That's one of the reasons why I love places like ProAct. Yes. You know, 17th and Lehigh, yeah. 17th Proact. and Lehigh, mm -hmm. which is really my old neighborhood, that area around yeah. there mm -hmm. which is where I grew up. But I'm just saying, you wonder if uh, part of the reason for not having the support is because the community, and I don't mean that in the most recent years, I mean in a couple last five or six years, there have been a, a concerted effort to make community a part of individuals' recovery and to make yeah. individuals' recovery a part of community. And that the need to have more community services that integrate recovery into them, wherever that may be, whether it's community college having a recovery program or, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, high schools now. High school. Well, yeah, we did a whole two shows yeah. on recovery yeah. high school, mm -hmm. you know, in that sense. So I wonder if the community supports were there. Yes. That For me, been? the community supports was there. It was, it was me not seeking and, and oh, doing okay. what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, if I if I were then uh, when when that happened when I um, uh, got laid off then that would have been just another issue that you know we deal with mm -hmm. you know um, and I would have been have been able to deal with that in a a more positive way and um, get right back on the horse you know you send out your resumes you do whatever but right. instead I got in this 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 mode and. I'm all jumbled up here because, again, I stepped away from my support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I stepped away from uh, my sponsor. Right. I didn't, you know, I started isolating, you know, yeah. which is it, which is a bad thing for me. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I'm the only addict, but, you know, you go back to, to what you know. You, mm -hmm. you resort right back to what you know. And that's what happened to me because I wasn't doing uh, the footwork and continue to do the things that I needed to do. Yeah, yeah your um, resilience kind of yeah. went negative on right. you yeah. as opposed right. to positive. And right. Yvette, you are, are literally a miracle sitting, sitting back here as a recovering person yes. now. How 
long did it take you to get back from the relapse and what was different? What yeah. was different this time around? And how did you hook, and to add on to mm -hmm. Curry's thought, and how did you wind up on methadone? Okay, so uh, when I when I relapsed, I um, okay that was uh, um, 2012. So maybe a year, uh, maybe a year and four or five months. Okay, I was out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, um, and I thought you know to myself like um, before I lose the things that I've worked so hard for. Um, not so much vehicles and things like, my home is a big factor. Mm -hmm. If I don't have my home, I would be homeless. Um, things that, that really meant a lot. It, it, like when I brought my first home, it wasn't a thing of just buying my first home. It, it, it was a lot that led up to that. It, the hard work, the, the things that I, I would n never have thought about, I, I probably wouldn't have never done, was like you clean up your credit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. like it all results to just live in life normally, being a productive member, it all goes back to that. So for me, um, it took me a, a year and some months, and then I came around and said, well, all right, I, I missed something the first time. Mm -hmm. I missed something. Um, I didn't, I, I felt worse than I did the first time I got professional help mm -hmm. all those years ago. The second time, which is which is now, I I felt I felt worse. Like I said, it didn't even feel like I had ten years. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed like I was losing more faster than the first time. This time, I I felt I felt really bad. I felt uh, uh, the things that that an addict feels when they they have a relapse. You know, you you feel shame. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel the guilt. Um, you know, you've let your family down, you left yourself down first and foremost, of course. Um, my faith, which has a, a whole lot to do with um, my recovery. But for me, I thought I needed something more to, to help me along. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I just wanted to say I wanted to have some insurance mm -hmm. um, in the beginning which, um, well, it's kind of still in the beginning for me. It's um, June. Uh, so I guess since May of, of 2013 okay. up till now, mm -hmm. uh, I had put myself on the program and put myself in the, in the treatment. And um, I said I need a, a little bit more to help me along, just for me. Um, like I said, just for security, and maybe because I didn't trust myself mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning. So that's what I did. I, um, I looked into certain resources uh, and made some phone calls and just went on the steps that I needed to do, that I know I needed to do, mm -hmm. um, to get me uh, to be that productive member again and to become, you know, abstinence of all drugs. Um, this for me is, is, is a stepping stone. Um, methadone uh, maintenance. My recovery is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that's going to help me along, but it's it's not forever for me. Um, I'm going to do the program the way that it's instructed, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to move on. But uh, it comes back to, um, you know, it's certain things about uh, methadone I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. You know, like some people like to keep track of, of the dose and this and, you know, like I don't need to know those things. I need to work uh, more on myself um, and not making the same mistake twice again mm -hmm. or the, for the third time. I was going to ask make you, that what, what, what are you doing in addition to the, to the methadone? So how are you also right. supplementing? So, What's your um, arsenal? Right. <laughs> so my arsenal is um, my support group mm -hmm. and my meetings. Mm -hmm. um, not only, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not employed right now, but I think for me, I'm not, I don't need to be working at this point. Mm -hmm. um, my family. Um, I need to stay in touch with people that's on the same road that I'm on, yeah. like Andrew and I. Yeah. I have a lot of communication, a lot of conversations with Andrew. I need positive people in my life. Fantastic. The things that I, that I took myself away from 
in the beginning is the things that I'm going to get back and they're going to like just be real solid and stay right there. So I, when something does happen in my life, mm -hmm. I don't have to run to the hills and go back to what I know and resort back to that same old thing. I, I, lo know. I love hearing this. You know the thing that's really, really hitting me? You, 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 your use of, of certain language around all of this is very, very powerful. As soon as you said the word solid, I was thinking about what you said earlier, which was that everything got shaky. Yeah. The, the foundation came out yeah. from underneath. And it sounds like, and I think this is important, you know, a lot of people would look and, and say, well, you should be back to doing this and you should be back to doing this. But the truth is, you're building a solid foundation that wasn't built properly the first time around. Right. Right. And, and this is fantastic. I think this is an important and thing. Recovery for, is a process. Absolutely. It is. Yeah, it is a process. Absolutely. So you don't, on methadone, you're not familiar with your dose, right? You're blind right now, I'm, I say. I'm blind now because um, I'm coming down. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you, hear, you hear the war stories about, oh, when you get to this milligram, you're going to, and oh, when you, that's not my focus. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I came to be on the program, that wasn't my main focus. My main focus was to get your vet back to where she needs to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't need to be thinking about the numbers, and you know it all starts with this here. Mm -hmm. And once you get that obsession up here, and it just, the snowball just goes. So I don't need to be consumed and think about the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. Right. I'm doing what I need to do. When the doc says to me, well, guess what, you've had in the last couple of weeks or the last month, you've just been getting like, you know, doses of water. And I'll be like, fine. I mean, you know, but <laughs> the mind is a tricky thing. I mean, yeah. Uh, if that's what you're thinking, oh, when I get to this milligram, then I'm going to feel like this. And I'm going to, you know, I don't want to be consumed with that. I don't need to know. Mm -hmm. As long as I'm doing what I need to do. And um, you, every ache and pain that you get, it doesn't have to be. Be related to that. Related to that. <laughs> to that. Yeah. Every little no Sometimes I mean, it's, it's just a normal ache and it's pain, just, right? Uh, it's a normal, I mean, I'm you 50. Know. It's a normal ache and pain. There we go. You know? So uh, <laughs> when I go out, it's cold, it's the winter. You're going to have no sniffles. It, it doesn't mean, oh, my God, I need to boost my dope. Like, no, it's just, it's just, yeah. it's cold, so your nose is going to run outside a little yeah. bit. You know, yeah. we did, I, I just wanted to say, you know, you're talking about, like, you're on blind uh, detox, yeah. so to speak, or maintenance dose are moving down yeah. is that when I ran the methadone program we had people off of methadone just you know they used to come in every day if you're not familiar with methadone programs and they used to get that little juice you know right. like tang and they right. were drinking it's mixed in right. with some tang and you drink it and and there was a group of people that we felt could go to a zero detox and then you know just go into regular outpatient and the problem they had was that if you told them they would get like, I'm in withdrawal, right. my bones, everything hurts. So you're talking about the, the mental part mm -hmm. of detox. Mm -hmm. exactly. And they would be off of the drug for like a month. There you go. A month. Mm -hmm. And we would then go to them and say, oh, by the way, you're, you're drug free. And they would have withdrawal the next day. Okay. Okay. Basically, the <laughs> Can you believe that one? Right. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly what it is. It's a and, psychological. And I've it. never had this personal experience, it, but mm -hmm. people will tell you that. Um, Post-acute withdrawal. Yes. People spend years in prison, and um, the minute they walk out, they immediately feel, and they, they're not lying. They actually mm -hmm. feel yeah, they those do. physical right. withdrawal mm -hmm. symptoms. But there are physical, normal yeah. physical withdrawal. Yeah. I don't want to say there isn't. Right. Um, so the mind is, is definitely, the mind can lead you to either way, um, whether you want to be sick or you want to be okay, whatever, whatever the case is. Well, see, the, the interesting thing about the psychology of life yeah. or the mind is that, if it can do negative things to you, if you do positive things with your mind, like the whole resilience and flow stuff that mm -hmm. we talk about, it will help you move to a more positive place to live. So you really don't want to hang out with too many negative people mm -hmm. because the only thing they do is drag you back into right. the gutter, so to speak, yes. and make life more important. So it's very important that even if it's your own family members, that if they don't want to embrace you, you have to let them go. Mm -hmm. The power of positivity. Yeah. My aunt used to tell me when I was growing up that, uh, you know, you are the company you keep. And I didn't understand that. That's true. That. That's as true. A, as yes. a young kid, I'm yes. 15, 16 years old. I didn't understand that. And um, as I got older, I did. I, I don't associate with people who, unless I'm providing services, because I'm blessed and fortunate enough to actually work in the field now, um, unless I'm providing services or 12 step and trying to help someone, I don't hang out per se with people still in active addiction. Mm -hmm. That's just not something I choose to do. I don't drink. Um, 
I, I, unless I have a purpose for being at a bar, a family event, a restaurant, I don't go sit at a bar just to hang out anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and there's so many things that you hear in recovery that just aren't true. Well, I can't have fun anymore. I can't. I yeah, you tell me true. I have to stay clean for the rest of my life. I'm like, no, you just have to stay clean for today. Exactly. Just today. Exactly. And when you have but, trouble, <laughs> I used to say to uh, clients, I say to them, just go to sleep. Tomorrow's a different day. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow's a new day. I mean, and it doesn't follow you into the next day. No, yeah. no, one of the things I was told was you could start your day over at any time you want. That's to. exactly Absolutely. right. Absolutely. That's exactly you right. You start your day over whenever you want. I'm a huge fan of Joel Osteen. And, I, and, mm -hmm. and the power of positivity right. is amazing. What it can do in your life. I, I um, didn't necessarily want to be on methadone. This is my first time okay. being... Tell us being, a little bit about how you... Yeah. It was the only thing offered mm -hmm. to me. I went to Kirkbride Medical Center, and uh, they said, the only way we're going to pay for you inpatient is if you agree to stay on maintenance afterwards. Yep. And um, I, at that point in my life, I had a decision to make. I, I, what people uh, in NA or AA call moment of clarity. Mm -hmm. I was either going to die that day on the street, or I was going to pursue getting mm -hmm. clean. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't go on living the way I was anymore. Um, and through a series of events, uh, you know, a higher power interacting and nothing happens by coincidence. Um, I, I ended up in Kirkbride and my plan was to say yes to them just to get off the street. Mm -hmm. I'll go into this methadone clinic and, and, and I'll 30 I'm days I'm walking off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that didn't happen. Real good junkie thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my ideas, even in, yeah. my ideas were always the best. Of uh, course. You know what I mean? And my decisions yeah, yeah. were great and they led me to being homeless and a 10 year yeah. uh, opiate addiction and stuff. Recovery started to change when I started to take suggestions. You know, that's right, when it started exactly working. Right. So um, I, I agreed to go, and uh, you know, I was very bitter early in recovery. My, my and I tell people this now, my experience because a drug addiction, heroin was my love. I mean, it was my, it, it was my everything. companion. It was my love. It was, it was my your mate. Sex, it was, it was your life, everything. It was everything, it was Best everything to me. Right. So <laughs> now you're gonna tell me in recovery that. You're going to take away my only coping skill in life, the thing that I used to deal with, everything, because I didn't suffer from drugs. I suffered from life. That was my concept. Yep. I suffered from life, and I eased that pain with drugs. So now you're going to take that away, and you're going to tell me I have to be a responsible, productive member of society? That scared the... That Truly. scared me. So I was, I was bitter. I was resentful. I was angry. And I was projecting all those feelings on other people when really I felt all those things towards myself. But at that point in my life, I couldn't face that. Nothing still was my fault. Everything in my life was caused by external circumstances. Um, and in recovery, I learned all that. And I learned that I was responsible for my decisions. But anyway, getting back to the to methadone, I, I agreed to go. And um, my experience, I, I went to NHS, Northwestern Human Services, and my experience there has been great. From, from the counselors I've had there to the people I've worked with, it, it's just been amazing. And, and I've, I've had a great experience there. Um, and, and through some of the things the city offers, the transformation, some of the trainings, I was able to get trained mm -hmm. as a peer specialist. Certified peer certified specialist. Certified peer specialist. Um, I, was, I was afforded the opportunity to, I was offered a job at, at NHS, the same, same facility, uh, same company, excuse me, different facility. So now I receive services at one facility and I work in another. And, and the biggest thing people ask me is, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know you could do that. Mm -hmm. And my response to that is, I'm a walking billboard for their program that it uh -huh. works. Why wouldn't they want to hire me? You know what I mean? I'm a walking billboard to tell you that this program works. And I, um, my aunt told me, if you can find something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And I, I, you know, you, listen, you, I love this field. I love working with people. Um, you know, Yvette, like she said, is a participant there. And, and I'm just blessed to be able to get a paycheck. Sure. But one of the things I learned from listening to Yvette and other people in this program or in this process was my recovery is my recovery and my job is my job. I have to keep those mutually exclusive. Yes. I can't mm -hmm. mix. But, but also remember, at least I believe this, I don't know if you would all agree to this, but um, when your job becomes your life too, I mean in a positive way, yeah. when, when you go to work and you don't feel like you're going to work, and that's actually the way I feel about community. Absolutely. Is that you feel a certain 
uh, like comfort in your life. Oh, There's okay. no yes. anxiety. Mm -hmm. You're not doing things that are antagonistic to the way you want to be. Mm -hmm. the, actually, the job is a is part. part of me. It's a little bit like when we train people to be counselors here at the college. We say, learn these skills, even though they might conflict with some of your thoughts. But down the road, our expectation is that your professional self will become yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And, you know, and that, that's the whole idea. Your recovery becomes what your life is, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed yeah, and to I, and I you're separated that. from it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that too. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, and and I'm very passionate about my job, and, and and I love it. I guess what I'm trying to say is I can't use my job yes. as my mm -hmm. main yeah. source of. And, and and she'll tell you in her story. Mm -hmm. I, I still have to do what got me to the position of of recovery. My support group, the men in my life. I have an accountability partner, a kid named Chris that I came into the program with that I'm extremely close with. I mean, just to have friends today is, is amazing for me. Sure. Uh, absolutely. So, let me say, we only have a few more minutes. What I'd like to ask both of you is, uh, tell me what you do now. Uh, I mean, what is your position? Uh, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about what it is and, and how you see your life going from here on out. Well, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a peer You're specialist. peer specialist. I, um, I'm in school. I'm, I'm actually, I work full time. I'm also in school full time. My, my at community college. At community fall. college, yes. <laughs> Yay! My, my ultimate goal <laughs> is to get a, uh, my uh, doctorate in addiction studies. I just, I'm kind of fixated on the goal of a 10-year opiate addiction to a doctor. I think that whole thing is, is amazing. So that's my ultimate goal. In the meantime, I just, I just want to be... Um, someone that my daughter's proud of. I want to be a good father, a good husband. I want to be the man that my family raised me to be and knew mm -hmm. I could be my mm -hmm. whole life. And yeah. That's yeah. it. I mean, I'm, I'm a born again Christian. I, um, my faith is extremely important to me. Uh, my pastors plays a huge part in my life. Um, so I, I just, I mean, to sum it up, I just want to be the man that my family raised me to be. Oh, well, I'm telling you, you're fantastic. getting there because fantastic. I have you in class mm -hmm. and I listen to your stories mm -hmm. and I get a lot of your reports back and you are the man. You well, thank you. you. Well, most, I well. can attest to that too. I can attest to that as a faculty member. Yvette, how about, how about Yvette? Yvette? for you? Well, uh, for me right now, I guess I'm just a little bit more um, uh, laid back in a sense. Like, I'm not in the working field. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, I was I was so in a hurry to get back to work, get mm -hmm. back to work, and I said, "Well, I need to take a step back for a minute." Um, I'm involved with the advocacy board at NHS, so um, I'm involved uh, with things right now because I'm building my foundation. Yeah. And um, once I feel as though that's um, really nice and solid, um, uh, besides just being uh, an everyday person that you know has a mortgage, a bill, gas and electric, mm -hmm. or, you know, but just a normal everyday person. Um, uh, the thing is uh, uh, about methadone. There's there's uh, there's a, a lot of people that's that's on the programs, and the people, the positive people that are doing the right things, um, that are just living uh, productive lives. Those are the people that we don't we don't hear about, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are some positive people out there that's on these programs mm -hmm. that are just living life. Um, uh, but for me right now, I'm just uh, building, um, and maybe in another, uh, I'll say a month or so, maybe I'll be back into the employment field. It's not like I don't have the experience because right. I was uh, in the field for uh, ten years or so. So uh, uh, hopefully that'll be uh, my next goal. Oh, great. Yvette's Beautiful. being modest. She's a, a, an, a very active participant in our program. She's a, a volunteer, and she really is a model, a model participant. Mm. So she is being modest because that's her personality, but she plays a huge part um, with supporting other women, not just women, women and men, but um, if anybody's ever going through something at, at the clinic, they can go to a vet, talk to her, and, um, you know, if the peer advocacy board is something we have. Uh, it's made up of members that support other newer clients or anybody going through anything, mm -hmm. and she's an active member in that. So she she does. She may not be gainfully employed, but she works, and mm -hmm. she works at her recovery. She's employed. She's not getting a paycheck. Yes, yeah. she's not. Getting, <laughs> yes. Well, look, I what what an honor! What yeah. an honor to be with people in recovery as a person in recovery. Yes, just mm -hmm. just yeah. a joy. 
I think you're both doing great, actually. Well, thank, thank you. you. I, it's, it's a and blessing. I think, and I'll take credit partly for the college that yes. we helped <laughs> right. both of you. Because I think you're in the behavioral health program. That's right. Or graduated from the behavioral health program. Well, I want to thank my co-host, Kerry Arnold, and my guests, Yvette and Andrew, for joining me today. You have been watching The Tapestry of Life on CCPTV, Community College of Philadelphia's educational channel. I'm Dr. Pascal Scholes. See you next time. Thank you.